Hi, everybody. Hope you're well. Uh, today I will read from a book titled Patio, edited by Florina Rodenberger, Hammer, and Katrin Morand, and published by Patrick Frey. The scene is emotionally fraught, a little way away from the village, at the edge of a field of baobabs, a man is kneeling on the ground under the blazing sun, meditating. It is a moment of communion with his ancestors, who are buried there at the feet of the hundred-year-old trees that hold their branches high, reaching towards the sky. Then he stands up motioning with his head to indicate that his father and mother are buried there too. The village is Gibare, 80 kilometers from Ouagadougou. The man is Pateo, the great Abidjan-based fashion designer, originally from Burkina Faso, who has helped African fashion gain the distinction and respect it deserves and inspired a whole generation of African designers. His clothes, which valorize African savoir-faire, are worn by a number of public figures and celebrities, as well as plenty of average Africans who appreciate these light, colorful cotton garments which suit the climate and their complexion. To understand who Pateo really is, you have really got to go with him to his native village and watch him sitting outside a hut conversing with the village elders and receiving their blessings, catching up with his family and helping villagers out with a few bags here and a few bags there. As he says himself, he hasn't forgotten his roots and everything he's been through since the day he left his native village. He owes his equilibrium, his common sense, his sagacity, if you will, to the bond he's always maintained with his village his roots, his family. As Philippe Sawadogo aptly describes him, Pateo is like a Sankofa, the mythical bird flying forward with its head turned backwards. Pateo is now above all a familiar brand in Côte d'Ivoire, West Africa and beyond. This wide range of readily recognizable apparel is the fruit of a constant exploration of materials, colors and shapes to create things of beauty. At the start of his career, Pateo worked wonders with wax prints. Many people still remember the spectacular outfit he put together out of the Uniwax company's Oiseaux Peigne, for which he won the Ciseau d'Or Fashion Contest. He then turned to other fabrics, such as Bogolan, Gita, and Faso Danfani, which he worked into African-inspired clothing revisited from a contemporary angle. He also enlisted dyers, those wizards of color, to dye cotton fabrics he brought in from India, China, Switzerland, and Austria. An ardent advocate of Made in Africa, he regretted that as soon as it was picked, the fine cotton grown in Burkina Faso, Côte d'Ivoire and Chad was hauled off to the nearest port to be processed in the other climates, instead of being woven on the spot there in West Africa. This great designer doesn't confine his efforts to creating sumptuous clothes, putting on flamboyant fashion shows and rubbing shoulders with the great and the good. For he always has Africa's well-being at heart and gives a great deal of thought to ways in which to improve the lot of its people. In fact, everything about the continent matters to him. He travels a lot and he knows firsthand what Africa has to offer to the world. Pateo advocates nothing short of a cultural revolution built on Africa's rich resources, its creativity and know-how. And how people dress is part of this cultural revolution. One reason meeting Nelson Mandela in 1998 was so important to Pateo was that Mandela was the first African president to cast off the formality of Western business suits to don colorful, loose-fitting, well-worn clothes created by African designers instead, including Pateo himself. The situation has improved since then, but too slowly in his opinion. Ivorian politicians and Yuppies do wear African clothes these days, but only in private, in their own homes or at friends on the weekends. 
Then, Monday morning, they drive back to their air-conditioned offices in dark three-piece suits. In Burkina Faso, on the other hand, Faso Danfani, the national fabric, is woven domestically and is now worn with pride by people from all walks of life, much to Pateo's delight. The term Faso Danfani comes from the Yula language. Indeed, the fact that it's Yula and not Bamana, More, Sanufo or other regional languages is important in itself. The central part of West Africa was home to the Mali Empire, 13th to 17th century, whose main inhabitants were Mande people, including the Bamana, Malinke, Mende, Marka and others. More famously, it was the home of Mansa Musa, 1280-1337, the richest person in history, at least until very recent times. His lavish pilgrimage to Mecca drew the attention of traders from well beyond the African continent. The Mali Empire cultivated a strong trade network that moved precious goods, such as salt, gold and clothes, in and out of its lands. Due to the vast territory that it covered, traders mainly communicated in Yula, a Mande language primarily utilized in the exchange of these goods. The roots of Faso Danfani lie in this trade. Every region has a cloth it was known for, and all of these textiles were technically Faso, country, Dan, by hand, Fani, cloth. Literally, country cloth made by hand. Even today, on the western coast of West Africa, you will find similar indigo country cloth that has its origins in the trade and migrations that took place in the Mande region over the centuries. Faso is generally used in the same way as the English word country. It can designate a region or area, often rural, or it describes a nation. Today, in Burkina Faso, Faso Danfani is considered to be cloth that is hand-woven in this nation by weavers of the many ethnicities comprising Burkina Faso. Much of the Faso Danfani that is produced in Burkina Faso, a textile that has been made for hundreds of years, is woven by men using both natural and indigo dyed cotton thread to create barb face striped cloth. They technically used wooden, double-headed looms to produce narrow strips of cloth that are then sewn together. These weavers are male farmers who create basic cloth during the dry season, either plain and undecorated or woven in the style of their ethnicity. Other weavers are male professionals who practice their art year-round and earn their primary source of income in family workshops where women spin thread and dye it for the men to weave. The majority of these family workshops are Mande or Mande in origin, although weavers can of course operate in any village or city and among a wide range of ethnicities. Today, these professional weavers are primarily found in rural areas where their clients order patterns of cloth associated either with their ethnicity or their region. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.